Mini episode 887 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to mini-episode number 887 of the FDH Lounge. You have with us today FDH Lounge dignitaries Rick Morris and Steve Callis. We are here to break down the 2017 MLB postseason. And just to lift the curtain a little bit here, as we do sometimes with the show, we were to be joined also by our good friend uh, Joe Stazak, who does the weekly podcast with Steve Callis, Callis Remarks. Joe unable to join us. He's a little bit uh, under the weather today. Hope he's feeling good. I know we both hope that's the case. Uh, Although, as I said to Steve off air, probably for the best to do a one-on-one today just with the circumstances being what they are. Again, just to lift the curtain up, sometimes we record segments, have them in the can for a while. Sometimes we've got to put them out right away. 2017 MLB postseason, this is pretty time sensitive. So we're recording this, God willing, getting this up right uh, after we record this. So that being the case, you, you know that here October 2nd, 2017, with all the very bad news coming out of uh, Las Vegas, I'm like a lot of people right now. My head's kind of a little blurry. My focus isn't really necessarily there. Again, our, our best wishes and our prayers to uh, everyone involved uh, with the horrible, horrible thing that happened out there. So as I said to Steve off here, a little bit of one-on-one is, is probably going to do me better. in in terms of guiding us along as opposed to uh, juggling three different uh, folks, myself included, as we're going through. But uh, Steve, uh, always a pleasure to be on with you, my friend, and uh, a little bit of baseball talk uh, will hopefully lift everyone's spirits a little bit. Yeah, great to be with you. Very sad what happened in Vegas. Very, uh, you know, kind of the world we live in. Don't know all the details yet, but... uh... Just really horrific stuff out there. And as for Joe Stasek, great guy, knowledgeable guy. Hope he feels better as well. But looking forward to this because the playoffs start tomorrow. They do indeed. Tomorrow as we're recording this, and that will be with the wild card games, and uh, that'll be the first focus in terms of the action that we're going to get to. But prior to that, I want to get your thoughts just sort of writ large because it seems to be sort of a more interesting dynamic than usual going into the playoffs this year in terms of looking at it and being able to really kind of assess whether teams are coming in the way that they want to be coming in or not. Certainly my hometown Cleveland Indians are coming in uh, pretty much the way that you would really hope if you're a fan of the team as I am with everything that they've had going on the streak, the way that they played well after the streak. I know that the Boston Red Sox have said in recent days that they feel like having the Yankees breathing down their necks has kept them a little bit sharper. They, of course, were first-round sweep victims to the Indians a year ago, and uh, they feel like in retrospect they weren't necessarily so sharp because they didn't have anything to play for. The Colorado Rockies, they had a lot to play for right up to the very end here. Uh, Because unlike Arizona, who pretty much put their uh, wild card spot away early, uh, the Rockies, the second half of the season, it was not quite the same. But in September, they rallied, were able to hang on to the spot. On the other end of the spectrum, you got the L.A. Dodgers, who uh, at midseason, people were asking uh, with a straight face if they were perhaps the greatest team ever. And uh, over the course of, uh, again, I really kind of feel like over a 162-game season, as, as in no other sport, basically water finds its own level. And the Dodgers, yes, you could look at them in the beginning of the year and plausibly think they're about a 100-win team if everything went well. Same thing kind of with the Indians, but... You know, the Indians looked like a disappointment a good part of the season. The Dodgers looked like the best team ever for the first half of the season. In the end, they come out with about the same kind of record. But i got to think when you're looking at momentum right now, you'd probably rather be on the Indians' end of the spectrum than you would be the Dodgers. Oh, no question. And I think that's true in all sports. It really is who's playing the best at the end of the season, obviously who plays best in the playoffs. Uh, And I think that's just another case this year. Uh, I don't even know why people talk about the greatest team ever because you can't even say that until the World Series is over. 
see the Seattle Mariners 116 victories. They lose to the Yankees in the playoffs. See even the 1954 uh, Cleveland Indians 111 wins, yep. 110 wins. Uh, one of the greatest teams of all time in the regular season, and then Willie Mays takes the catch on Vic Wirtz in Game One, and that turns into an incredible upset sweep by the Giants. So I think it's kind of a waste of time nowadays, coupled with the fact, rightly or wrongly, uh, nowadays, as you know, the ring's the thing. If you don't have a championship, you had a bad season. Once upon a time, again, before expansion in the 60s in baseball, you had eight teams. If you won your pennant, if you won your league, there were, you know, these teams don't play for the pennant. They're playing for the pennant now. Right. And if you won the pen and lost in the World Series, for the most part, with rare exceptions like the 54 Indians or the 60 Yankees to the Pirates, you had a really good season. Nowadays, it's not like that. If you have an incredible regular season, if the Warriors win 73 games and lose in the finals, they didn't have such a great season. So I think it's a, a, a double thing. It's really... Who wins the championship, coupled with the fact that for whatever reason now, the media, the fans, the way we are today, winning is the only thing. There's only one team happy at the end of the year. For whatever reason, it's not irrelevant what you do in the postseason, but vis-a-vis the, uh, what you do in the regular season, rather, but vis-a-vis who wins the championship, obviously that's the biggest thing by 10 miles. You're very much right about that, and just one weird kind of way of looking at things here. This is something that I wanted to do once the regular season was done, just to satisfy my own curiosity. The Indians winning 102 games during the regular season, but a great statistical oddity, 6-14 and against the National League, and and not just uh, against uh, the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks and whatever. This team was pretty barfy against even like the Padres, the Giants. It was just an oddity. So I, I wanted to subtract that out, and I found out that if it was just against American League competition, as would have been the case before 1997, this team would have had a 676 winning percentage. That equates out to 109.5 wins if you're playing an American League-only schedule. So uh, on, on the one hand, uh, very impressive in terms of American League competition. On the other hand, you know, the, the Indians, to go all the way, are going to have to face somebody from the National League. So I don't know if that's more good news or bad news for Indians fans. Well, I think, you know, again, a 20-game sample, I don't think it's uh, such a big deal. If right. they had had a lot of those games during a 22-game win streak, I'm guessing their record would have been much better. But I'm just guessing. We'll never know. But having said all of that, um, those kinds of matchups, well, I would say to you, well, they were pretty good against the Cubs last year, just not good enough. They lost 4-3. to three, So <laughs> I understand what you're saying. I don't think that really, really matters. Uh, you know, some people are saying someday they'll – Maybe just be in the American League, no divisions, and National League, no divisions. Other people are saying maybe there should just be no. You know, people have said this in the NBA. Maybe they should just have one full league division and the top 16 teams make the playoffs because guys in the West who finish ninth would be like fifth in the East. That's happened a few times now in the last few years. I don't think we're going there. I don't put as much stock in. It's interesting uh, being as old as I am and remembering when. Uh, they never played each other at all except in the All-Star game. Well, I guess you're right. it really is until 97, uh, so that's not that long ago. But remembering, for example, the World Series was such a big deal because how would Mickey Mantle do against the Bofax? They've never faced each other, that kind of stuff, Right. for example. Uh, and that stuff is all kind of out the window now. The All-Star game isn't what it used to be. Aside from the competitive, we're all multi, multi-million dollar uh, entities now. We don't want to get hurt. Once upon a time, there was great pride in the All-Star game. I'm not saying there's not pride now. It's just not as important. Once upon a time, guys played seven, eight innings, you know, in the All-Star right. game, even complete games in the All-Star game. Uh, so it's just a different mentality now. Uh, I put only a little stock in it only because it's just 20 games. If you told me it was 81 games against the American League and 81 games against the National League and they were terrible against the National League, that would be much more meaningful to me. Right, and it's all about when the games are played, and you're right about that. And again, 
the strongest line of demarcation for the Indians, whether it be before or afterwards, uh, was the trade for Jay Bruce because it was something like 35 and 9 or something like that. Uh, that's not an exact number, but that's off the top of my head after they got him. And of course, that encompasses the 22 game win streak. But I was there for somewhat of an earlier line of demarcation. It was a Saturday night game, Jason Kipnis bobblehead night. I got to give uh, credit to FDH lounge dignitary Tom Denk for uh, getting me a ticket to the game there with him. And uh, that it was uh, Jason Kipnis bobblehead night. Uh, Lindor won the game with a walk-off, and for a guy who was getting a lot of MVP talk late in the year, we kind of tend to forget what a donut hole kind of a year it was, because the middle of the year was really not so great. Even some of the first half of the year was really kind of a fall-off. Lindor was really uh, en fuego over the course of uh, the last several weeks of the season, two months plus. But uh, it's been uh, a very, very interesting ride throughout the season. No more so, I would say, than in terms of the wild card teams that are going to be playing in the games this week here, because in the American League, you got two teams that I think most people would say are probably ahead of schedule as far as what was expected of them, and I would argue that the representative from the AL Central, uh, quite frankly, not even necessarily that uh, uh, strong a representative, but uh, the best of kind of a mediocre lot, I would say. In the National League West, a uh, strong division, albeit top-heavy, uh, with the three teams versus the two teams there. Arizona, as I mentioned earlier, had a much stronger ride all the way through than did Colorado. But looking at the two games there, first up, the American League game, uh, a lot of people are thinking that it's kind of a uh, foregone conclusion. The Yankees have played very well against the Twins in recent years, not least of which the times they've caught them in the playoffs. you got Severino going for the Yankees. Uh, the Twins, again, young pitching has been the kind of donut hole for them to go back to that term in terms of their young development. Uh, so uh, the Yankees are pretty strong favorites in a lot of quarters, as are Arizona the, with the Diamondbacks there ha having the, uh, the, the home field advantage, like I said, playing much stronger all throughout the season. Colorado, I had just seen the other day, uh, has not played nearly as well there. That, that's a team that's always going to have home road splits, but apparently they're a little bit more pronounced offensively when they're at Chase Field. So I'm going to go with the chalk in both games here. Uh, I, I don't know that the Yankees and the Diamondbacks are necessarily going to win in blowouts because uh, you don't tend to get as many of those necessarily in October, or at least whenever you expect them, they don't tend to materialize. But I'm looking at the Yankees and Diamondbacks in those two games. How do you see it, Steve? Well, I have to go with you. Um, I, I totally disagree with the notion um, and, and it's the feeling in New York, well, you know, the Yankees are going to be heavily favored. they got Severino going. Blah, 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 blah. It's baseball, and it's only one game. So the Phillies could be in one of these wild card games, as far as I'm concerned, and have a chance to win because it's baseball. Um, specifically with this game, though, and what I found interesting, and I don't think you're going to hear this in any other places, it's any other places, Rick, is a couple of weeks ago they decided, the Yankees decided to change their rotation so Severino would be available. It looked like they couldn't catch the Red Sox. And obviously it went down to the last two days because the Red Sox finally stopped playing really well. Both the Yankees and the Red Sox in September were great. But towards the end, the Red Sox lost a few games. To kind of make it mathematically possible, I think, if the Red Sox lost their last four or five and the Yankees won their last four or five, they'd be a tie and the Yankees had the edge by one game in the season series. So the Yankees changed their rotation not thinking they would have a chance to win. The division, they had a chance and they didn't. The Red Sox clinched on Saturday with a victory. Um, but he, what I've been fascinated, because they changed the days that Severino pitched so he'd be on uh, uh, rest for for the wild card game, he wound up pitching against the Twins on September 20th. The Twins had not seen him all year. Um, I personally think it's an advantage for the other team not to see my top pitcher. But because of this realignment and schedule making for the days, um, Severino started against the Twins. Now, uh, I heard uh, Ken Rosenthal or some baseball expert saying the Twins knocked Severino out, uh, and he only pitched three-plus innings. I don't think they knocked him out per se. I think what happened was he got enough pitches in. Uh, he was losing the game. The Yankees came back and won that game. But they just wanted to get him out of there. But here's what I think was so key, and this may play a factor uh, tomorrow. In the third inning, 
Joe Maurer, who is still an excellent player, an excellent hitter, almost gets overshadowed by some of these guys. And rightfully so. Buxton, Dozier, these guys are big-time players. But Joe Maurer's kind of been there forever, been there, done that kind of guy. He had a 12 or 13 pitch at bat against Severino, and he fouled off literally six or seven, three, two pitches. This was with the bases loaded in the third inning. And on the 13th pitch, he hit a line single to right, driving in two runs. Now, after the game, Severino was interviewed. He's a young pitcher. He's, he's, you know, he tells you what he's thinking. And he said, yeah, Mauer really tired me out with that at bat, I have to say. Hats off to him. One of those things, being complimentary as he should, I remember sending a text to my son that he could try and find it online. They should put that at bat in a time capsule. Now, the time capsule might only be two weeks later, because you can see a similar kind of thing happening. And now are they in Severino's head? You know, Severino was horrific last year, as you probably know. I right. mean, horrific. Turned it around, got his secondary pitches working, has a good change now, and he was fantastic this year. I mean, talk about one of the biggest jumps ever from last year to this year. He was 0-8 as a starter last year. So I found it interesting, and I, I'm surprised a lot more has not been made of this, but the fact that, that the Twins saw Severino essentially one and a half times around the order, um, I think that's important. So, And also, as good as Severino is, you don't know what he's going to be in the big spot. You just don't know. Um, so I like the Yankees, but I certainly give the Minnesota Twins more than a puncher's chance to win this game. And I'll say it again, of course. This is baseball. And, right. of course, Severino's going against Irvin Santana, who's been around forever. You know, he pitched with the 2005 ALDS against the Yankees, and he beat the Yankees. He's been around forever, uh, hasn't had a lot of playoff experience, but I, I remember that game. And he's a big-time pitcher this year. He's 16-8. and eight. Um and I should mention, you know, the Twins are like the shock of baseball. Paul Molitor is the manager of the year, hands down. They lost more than 100 games last year. They're the first team in the history of baseball to lose 100 or more games and come back the next year and make the playoffs. Right. So they got a lot, they got a lot going for them. There's Buxton's a superstar that nobody knows. Dozier is like a 30 home run guy every year as a second baseman. Uh, Mauer's Mauer. They got other guys, Rosario, Polanco, Escobar. Again, this is a one shot deal. Um, Miguel Sena coming off the DL. Uh, apparently, he's not going to start, but uh, you know he's available now. That gives them a mental lift up, if nothing else. So I think uh, one game, I would not be surprised if the Twins win, but certainly if I have to pick the game, I'm going to pick the Yankees. I didn't say much about the Yankees, but everybody knows about Judge. But Sanchez missed like three or four weeks and hit 30 home runs. Uh, they have a nasty lineup and a fantastic bullpen. So I still do like the Yankees, but I don't think it's the cut and dry thing that other people seem to think it will be. I would kind of agree with that, and that's a real clip and save with what you said there about uh, the Twins getting a chance to see Severino, and will that uh, come back to bite them. Uh, in the National League game there, a little bit of kind of the same story as far as one of the teams having a big pitching edge, and that, of course, being the home team with Zach Greinke getting the start for Arizona. It'll be John Gray, I believe, going out there for Colorado. Uh, again, uh, the, the kind of year that uh, Arizona's had versus the uneven kind of a year that uh, Colorado's had, albeit getting a little bit more momentum back recently here. But uh, again, the fact that Colorado offensively their game doesn't play nearly as well at Chase. Uh, are you on Arizona with me? Yeah, I am. Uh, Greinke, a season starter, was good against, you know, pitched well against the Rockies this year. 37 strikeouts versus two walks in 34 innings. Uh, he has allowed six home runs, including two to um, Trevor Story. Um, Carlos Gonzalez also has good numbers against Greinke. But Greinke, 13-1 and one at home with 2.87 ERA. And I think what not only puts me over the top for Arizona in the wild card, but maybe for the Dodgers when we talk about that, is this pickup of J.D. Martinez um, is, is one of, I mean, Jay Bruce was an excellent pickup. Verlander we'll talk about is a great pickup. But this J.D. Martinez, 29 home runs in 60 games. It's almost unfathomable what he's done for them. Uh, look, John Gray's a good pitcher, 25 years old. He's not Greinke. Um I just think they do have the pitching edge. They are at home. 
they have the second best home record in baseball behind the Dodgers, of course. I know we'll talk about the Dodgers. Um, so I'll give Arizona the edge, and, and you know, they're kind of loaded themselves. I mean, Goldschmidt's an MVP candidate. Martinez, to me, is the pickup of the year. Paul Goldschmidt seems to be a MVP candidate every year. So uh, I'm impressed that Colorado made it for three teams from one division to make it is also a difficult thing. Um, but I'm going to go with Arizona in that game as well. Okay, so we're in accord so far. Looking at the American League, that sets up a series that would be uh, the Yankees against the Indians with the Indians having home field advantage and Boston at Houston over the course of five games. So the Astros having home field advantage in that one in three of the games. And in looking at both of these here, uh, again, I think the Yankees having to burn Severino in a wild card game really is something that's, uh, if the Indians win this thing, as I expect that they will in four, I think that will prove to be very, very key because there's a drop-off from, uh, at least over the course of the year, on any given day, Tanaka has shown, you know, some of these guys, they can still kind of bring it, but as far as what you can expect from the Indians, who didn't even have Carlos Carrasco in the postseason a year ago, Danny Salazar back in there, although he has either a puncher's chance of being dominant or having things go wrong at this point here. But with Clevenger uh, in all likelihood coming out of the bullpen, uh, I think they're going to have a quick hook for Salazar on, on his start if things don't go well. Trevor Bowers really turned things around this year. you got the depth of the Indians' offense that they've had up and down the line here now with potentially getting both Chisholm Hall and Brantley back as they have played in the last week here. Uh, it, it seems a lot to expect the Yankees to be able to stop the Indians' role at this point. Well, I agree with that, and I'm basing that as much on hitting as the pitching because, and you probably know this, the Indians have, for the first time since 1956, three guys with more than 16 wins. Of course, Kluber, 18-4, and four, the 2.25 ERA, uh, ERA, and most impressively to me, a 0.86 whip. I mean, that's like unheard of for a starting pitcher for yep. an entire season. Uh, he's he's going to beat Sale for the uh, Cy Young if he doesn't. That's a real joke. We're going to send a letter. But Carrasco, 18 and six with a 3.29, and Bauer, 17 and nine. So Indians haven't had that since decades ago, 61 years ago, um, and I think that gives them the edge. As for the Yankees. Look, Severino has been great, but as you said, he's if they win, he's going to not, I guess he can pitch game three. But CC Sabathia has, has reinvented himself, and he's a nice junk ball pitcher, uh, but they usually don't have that much success in the playoffs, as, as you know. Um, Tanaka... Now, look, he struck out 15 and in seven innings the other day. He was unhittable. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But he can just as easily be hittable. I think he gave up like 35 home runs. I don't know the exact number. But he gave up a ton of home runs. And with a guy like Tanaka, you're talking literally three or four inches. If, if his ball is up three or four inches, uh, you, especially teams like, like the Indians with all the hitters they have, are going to tee off on him. So it's going to be... Uh, which Tanaka shows up, and if the wrong one shows up, the Yankees have no chance. So I don't think they're good enough pitch-wise. They have an excellent offense, as you know. We Sanchez with all, uh, Aaron Judge with these incredible records that um, you know, 52 home runs, the most ever beat Mark McGuire. That's that's pre-Andrew Mark McGuire with the A's. He had 49. Um, the numbers are incredible. Lee Gregorius is one of the great, valuable Yankees that nobody knows about. He's like Jose Ramirez of last year for the Indians, because nobody knew who Jose Ramirez was, except the Cleveland Indians fan last year. I think you were one of the guys, a couple of people in Cleveland told me that he was really the MVP of the Indians for the regular season, and nobody outside of Cleveland knew who he was. So right. I think I think the Yankees are going to have some trouble. Kluber in the postseason, 4-1 and one with a 1.83 ERA. Uh, going back to what you were talking about with their record, he did beat Gus twice in the World Series last year, as I'm sure you know. Uh, Andrew Miller, to me, is the most valuable reliever. I don't know if I can say he's the best reliever in baseball. Um, of all the trades the Yankees made, and give Cashman a lot of credit for getting them earlier, but of all the trades he made for prospects last year, um, I think you know, Andrew Miller was a huge mistake. Chapman's been up and down, as you know, but Tams is a total mystery at times. They still have a great bullpen despite that because 
they, you know, they picked up all these really good relievers and <laughs> brought David Robertson back, among others. Um, but I think the Indians have too much, and I haven't even talked about it, and I'm sure you can talk more about them now. But Lindor and Ramirez, I think, were both MVP candidates. Uh, I know what you're saying about the donut hole with Lindor. Same thing happened with Aaron Judge. Uh, he had yes. a horrific July and August, horrific. But now he's come back in September to, I believe, be named the player of the month in September. Uh, and he's a five-tool player, by the way. A lot of people outside of New York don't know that. He can hit, hit with power, he can run, he can field, and he's got a good arm. He really is a five-tool guy. Um, look, strikes out a million times, but that's irrelevant nowadays in today's game of baseball. Uh, home runs the thing. But uh, I think the Indians, you know, three switch hitters, Lindor, Ramirez, Carlos Santana, and they've done this this year and last year without Michael Brantley, who was arguably the best player. So it's really a tribute. Uh, I should also mention Jay Bruce. He came to the Mets last year and was horrifically bad. Like, get him out of town horrifically bad. The Mets kept him. He had a really good season for the Mets, who, of course, went nowhere. And now, obviously, he's been a big contributor uh, in 43 games, seven home runs, and 26 RBIs uh, for the Indians. And, and I have to throw in Austin Jackson with easily the best catch of the year, jumping sideways over the wall at Fenway. That's right. Uh, that's, that's the best catch of the year, no matter what other catches you see. That's right. That was pretty awesome when he was able to do that. And yeah, Lindor and Ramirez, I think Jose Ramirez uh, should be the MVP this year. He won't be because the Indians are going to split the votes there. There will even be some votes for Kluber in there. So Jose's not going to win it. But uh, it's very interesting about them being the, the MVP candidates because having Jay Bruce and Encarnacion, I'll tell you this, as an Indians fan, I've been screaming for 15 years to get one guy like that in the lineup. The Indians in the last 12 months have gone out and gotten two of them. And I'm not going to say that's the only reason, but there's a little bit of cause and effect there when you look at the cascading effect up and down the lineup and the pitches that everybody else gets to see, the opportunities that they have, the less pressure on everybody else in the lineup from having two legitimate cleanup hitters in there the way that the Indians do. So it's uh, going to be pretty wild to see that playing out and to see uh, in all likelihood if, if it, uh, we tend to think it's going to be the Yankees, it would be Araldus Chapman against the Indians in their first series back in the postseason. So we have that to look forward to. Also in the American League, as mentioned, Houston with home field in their series against Boston. This is a series that to me is very, very uh, intriguing in terms of how the teams match up. Houston doing much the same as what the Cubs did uh, with, with a great rebuild after a very sharp uh, downturn, but doing it the right way with the prospects and coming together and then adding in the other pieces, uh, Justin Verlander late in the season. The thing in my mind that kind of tips it a little bit to Houston, and that's where I'm going to give the edge in this series, and looking at this, I would not have expected Boston in a year like this, in a year that they win the division, in a year with the offensive explosion in baseball, uh, to have had, I think, a disappointing offensive performance up and down the line based on what you would have expected from them. When you're looking at guys like Bogarts and Betts and some of the key players on this team not necessarily giving you what you wanted, even if Ben Benintendi kind of picked up the slack a little bit there, I think when you look at the the great over uh, or, uh, or, uh, unreliability, I should say, of David Price uh, coming into this series, who's never been a great October pitcher to begin with, you give the edge to Boston in the games where Sale pitches, even if it's against Verlander, I think, as hot as he's been. I'm not going to go against Chris Sale right now, but in the end, I'm going to say Houston in five games. I think it's going to be a dogfight. I, I think this series, to me, has the greatest chance of being a long series, with the possible exception of Washington and the Cubs, but I, I think this one could go right down to the ninth inning of the last game, if not longer. And I kind of tip it more towards the Astros because uh, I agree with everything you say about the Red Sox, but of course you understand they didn't have Big Poppy this year, incredible shoes to right. fill. Um, and also they missed, Pedroia missed a lot of time. And I think to take those two guys essentially out of the lineup, Pedroia to me seemed to be, I don't know, hurt on and off virtually the whole year. He only played 105 games. Uh you know, hit 293, but was not Pedroia. Uh, I think they've got real good young talent, this Devers and Ben Attendi. I mean, they're really good young players. Um, but here's my problem with Sale. He's never, historic, he's never pitched in the postseason. Right. Um, 
And I don't say it's going to be too big for him. You never know until they do it. And I don't think it will be. But historically, he's been very poor in August and September and seems to tire uh, as the year goes on. He gave up nine home runs in September this year, which is just unfathomable for a Chris Sale. And I think uh, I think that's a big problem. So while I agree with you, he's prob- they're probably the favorites when he pitches. I don't think they're the heavy favorites. Um, because I just think he's not going to be, frankly, what he was. I mean, I think he gave up, and look, this is the year of the homer, so to me, every pitcher's number is inflated. But he gave up 24 home runs this year, but 15 through the first five months and nine in September. I don't have the numbers exactly, but I know his ERA was much higher. He just wasn't Chris Sale at times in late August and September, and that's a problem. Porcello won the Cy Young last year. He's 11 and 17 this year. Pomerantz has been real good and probably is their number two, frankly. Um, Fister has been kind of a disappointment. Uh, Price, they're already putting him in the bullpen, and if you look at his numbers, I, th- I know he's never won a game as a starter in the postseason, and he has had some success as a reliever. When you flip that over to the Astros, now look, the Astros have their own semi-pitching problems. Verlander might be a, 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 a bigger addition than J.D. Martinez, even though Martinez plays every day. Verlander, 5-0, 1.06 as an Astro. I mean, gave him a second life, a second win, whatever you want to call it. Um, Keiko has not been Keiko. McCullers is a question mark. You know, Peacock and Morton, maybe one of them will start and be good. Um, but I think they just have, when you go up and down their lineup, it's just incredible, Rick. I think the difference between the Astros this year and the Astros last year, and I think they're threats at the plate, but they certainly, neither of them had great years. But to have two guys like Beltran and McCann um, in their lineup this year, as opposed to last year when they didn't have these kinds of guys, is a huge plus for the Astros. Uh, and, you know, we haven't even talked about Altuve wins his third batting title. Uh, and now look, see, I think he's the MVP because I think you're right. I think Ramirez and Lindor will split votes. Uh, I think a lot of people will not vote for Judge uh, because it's hard to vote for a guy who literally hit 200 for two months. As great as he was the other four, right. he, was, he was great. Um, so I think it's going to be Altuve, and deservedly so, because this year Correa got hurt and missed a lot of games. Springer missed a bunch of games. It wasn't like last year when we were talking about the Astros where they had like four stars who had played the whole year. This year it's really been Altuve playing the whole year, and I think that's going to put him over the top. But when you have to face a Correa, a Correa who's got 84 RBIs in 109 games, hit 315, his OPS is 941. Springer, 34 home runs, 85 RBIs. Uh, Marvin Gonzalez, 23 home runs, 90, 90 RBIs with a 907 OPS. And by the, by the way, Altuve's OPS, 957, higher than Correa, Correa, higher than Gonzalez, higher than virtually everybody on the Astros. Again, to show you, you see the little guy and you can't believe the power he has. So I think Altuve gets the job done and I think the Astros get the job done. And I'm going to go that they get the job done in four games. Um, because I just think they're that much better than Boston. And I totally agree with your analysis on Boston in terms of offense and baseball. Um, but they essentially lost Pedroia for 55 games, and they lost uh, Big Poppy for 162 games. And no matter how good these other guys play, that's a lot to make up for. It is. I'm not denying that. But uh, by the same token, I would have expected more out of them, particularly in a year where they are winning their division. Another team uh, that you would have expected more out of, I, I think a lot of us did coming off of last year, the Chicago Cubs, who really kind of took their sweet time in putting it together here during the course of the season, and I'm just struck by it. You talk about Boston and these statistics. You'd be hard-pressed to find any key contributors on the Cubs that didn't have uh, worse numbers this year than last year. But uh, nevertheless, in a landscape where, they, all they really had to kind of do was outlast the Brewers, who were you know early in their rebuilding process. 
Uh, St. Louis, which has been kind of a head-scratching team the last two years here, they, they kind of had the luxury of putting it together as they went along here and having a division uh, to a certain extent like the Indians. Nobody had a softer division than the Indians, but kind of the same kind of dynamic, that the Cubs were talented enough they could just kind of play their way into it, you know, win their 90-plus games, make the postseason. On the other hand, you got Washington, who we've seen many incarnations of this team, and I think there was a 100-win incarnation of them, I believe, in 2012. We've seen really excellent versions of Washington previously, but you got to stack this one up just about with any of the versions that we've seen in the last couple of years, not least of which having St- Steven Strasburg come back as strong as he has been and really begin to fulfill the promise that so many had for him. He and Scherzer in there being a 1-2 combination like they are. All of this really kind of tends to point in one direction here as I'm talking about what I expect to have happen here. But you get to the goofiness of October that we've kind of seen. And the Cubs being a team that not just won the World Series last year, made it to the National League Championship Series the year before. Everything with Washington and their struggles with getting out of the first round has pretty well been documented over a period of time. I'll I'll make an analogy for them, and it's very, very unfair to make this comparison, uh, but I did before this week of NFL games. And and I said, you know, for all the great moves that, uh, relatively speaking, that the Browns did in the offseason, upgrading the offensive line and putting money into the team finally in different spots, getting some impact players, and the national media's take on everything is LOL Browns. Well, guess what? You know, it's, it's a lazy take. It's an uneducated take. But it's the right take until the Browns prove it differently. And to a certain extent, I'm going to say the same thing here. We've seen what the Cubs can put together in the month of October, not least of which coming back from 3-1 in the World Series last year, as painful as that is for me to recount. Washington, yes, they did have a great uh, series against uh, the Dodgers in in terms of uh, almost getting out of the first round there. That's as close as they've come, but... Uh, Much like the Browns with their struggle to win a game or really do much of anything, Washington, until proven otherwise, I can't pick them in this spot, even though on paper they look much better to me. So I'm going to say Cubs in five. I do think it'll be another classic. Well, I have to agree with you there, too, because I have a different analogy for the Washington Nets. It's right there in Washington. It's probably kinder than mine. I've I've done a number of uh, shows with Joe Stasek, as you know, my podcast partner, and we analogize the Washington Nationals to the Washington Capitals. They always look good. They always seem to be right there. They're unbelievable. This is the year. This is the year. This is the year. And for that reason, right on paper, now Scherzer is probably not going to start in game one. He's got a hamstring. But Scherzer, Strasburg, and Gio Gonzalez third, that's a very nasty one, two, three, and when you look at them, Team ERA versus Team ERA, the bullpens for both teams, their Team ERA is over five. But for the starters, the Nationals' Team ERA is 3.40 for their starters to the year. And the Cubs' starters' ERA is 5.08, which is kind of amazing to the Cubs. Uh, but, yes, this is one, if you looked at the game on paper, on paper you would say the Nationals will win. But the Cubs are the defending champion. They won that game seven of the World Series. That's just like an unbelievable, you can't really, I don't really think you can quantify what that means in a playoff series that you won game seven of the World Series last year. It essentially brought everybody back. Not everybody, but almost everybody. The problem for, one of the problems for the Cubs is apparently Arietta's injured. It doesn't look like he's going to start before game three, and this is where uh, the Cubs' intelligence up of Quintana from the Crosstown White Sox, which I was shocked they would trade him to the Cubs. Uh, he's pitched fairly well. Hendricks has been good. Lackey is a gamer, whatever you think of John Lackey. I don't like John Lackey, but he's just giving the ball. I don't care what it is. You know, I think he pitched that game seven when he was very young. Didn't he pitch game seven in the World Series? Like yes, 2002. Or something. 2002 yeah, as a so, rookie. Right. So I don't know if he's going to actually start in this series, but do have other options. Uh, Lester has not been great, but his last was really good, and he's John Lester. I keep saying this about all these guys, because you can say it for all the Cubs. You're right about comparing them this year to last year, but now it's playoff time. It's you know literally a new season. Rizzo was still 32 home runs, 109 RBIs. Schwarber, who was so bad, they sent him to the minors and only hit 211. But his OBP, which is much more important, was 315, and he wound up, 
Travis Schwarber, um, he wound up with 30 home runs. So, and of course, you got Chris Bryant, who's become a perennial MVP candidate, 29 homers, 73 RBIs, 409 OBP, 946 OPS. So they still have the guys, I think, uh, who can do it. Uh, Wilson Contreras hit 21 home runs. You know, you don't get that kind of production from guys like him. Uh, I think they do it, and Zobris is one of my favorite players of all time. I always go back to the story. He did not have a good year, but I always go back to the story when he was with the MPA and Madden was the manager, and Zobris was one of the five guys in that place for the All-Star where you could vote for the All-Star, and Zobris was one of the five guys you could vote for, and they demanded that, and he said, well, if the American League wants to win the game, the fans will vote for Zobris. <laughs> Right. That, that's the greatest compliment you can give a baseball player, in my opinion. Plus, I think Madden is either the best or second best with Francona, manager in the major league. So I agree with you totally in that it looks like on paper, you know, Harper's coming back from injury. He's only had 18 at bats, but he's back. You know, Zimmerman had a great year. Murphy's Murphy. How the Mets ever traded him, I'll never know. And even uh, Anthony Rondon, 25 homers, 100 RBIs, 300 batting average. They've got it all on paper, I agree, uh, but I'm going to pick the Cubs really based on last year. And they are, they did play better in the second half, you're right, they were sleepwalking in the first half, but they did play better in the second half, and I'm going as much on winning playoff games as the Cubs have, including Game 7 of the World Series. I think that's, again, I don't really know how to quantify it, except they've been there and done that, the Nationals have not. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned another name there, Ryan Zimmerman, uh, some, another guy that was left for dead. So when you factor in Zimmerman bouncing back to look like he used to, Strasburg, that just shows you how deep and dangerous this team is. By the way, on the Jose Quintana thing, I can answer that for you. As a guy who's in a 20-team uh, deep keeper league, Eloy Jimenez, buddy, I got him on my roster, and let me tell you something, that guy's the truth. And you may see that as as soon as next year with the White Sox, man. That guy, you talk about uh, a five-tool killer. That guy can do it. Well, I guess there were, the Cubs' view is obviously they're a win-now team. And, uh, yep. Um, so they had to give to get. You know, that's how it works. Pretty much, yeah. As a matter of fact, I mean, I would say, too, you know, I, I, I almost think you hold out for even a better pitcher than Quintana, but uh, I guess it was kind of a – uh, seller's market at that point in time, and that's what they had to do to get them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, in a pure baseball sense, I think that might be the most fun series to watch. I'm really looking forward to that one. Then we come to uh, what's going to be, no matter what happens, the battle of the National League West, because whether whether we're right, if it's Arizona or if it's Colorado, either way, they're playing the Dodgers with home field. And uh, this is one you kind of hinted at something before, and uh, I think you and I may be going in the same kind of uh, subversive direction here relative to expectations because the thought is that the Dodgers, with the kind of year that they had, uh, they're, they're going to have it going well enough that they can at least make it through here, get back to the National League Championship Series, which they've made it. That's been their ceiling over the last decade, but they've made it there a couple points in time. If I was picking up what you were putting down correctly, it looks like we're on the same page because I've got Arizona pulling – the upset here. I'll say in four games, Kershaw again, he's got to kind of prove he can get it done in October. He's the most dominant pitcher of his generation, but uh, I know that uh, the Diamondbacks are going to have to burn Granke uh, to get through the wild card game, but you look at this offense up and down the line, you talk about the the addition that uh, Martinez has made to them, and that has been the case. Uh, Lamb has been a guy who has very quietly kind of developed into a a centerpiece of that lineup as well. Paul Goldschmidt, this is going to be his coming out party, I think, on the national stage, something that he, uh, the modern-day Paul Bunyan, has kind of been deprived of. Really, the the, the same year that uh, Aaron Judge makes the postseason. So uh, two kind of guys like that, although I think Aaron Judge uh, can only dream of uh, Goldschmidt's ability to make contact, and that that's somebody who I think should be a role model of his for his game going forward. But uh, Goldschmidt solidified as one of the best players in the game for years, and uh, again, I think he could be a real difference maker in this series. That's not going out on a very big limb because he's a perennial MVP candidate. The Dodgers bring a lot to bear, including their own young slugger, Cody Bellinger, with the kind of year that he's had. Uh, Corey Seaver, I think, is one of the best young players in the game, uh, in the making, a guy who's going to be a perennial MVP candidate. But here and now, 
I'm going to go with Arizona. I think uh, clearly they've been hotter than L.A. recently. Uh, most teams have been hotter than them recently because of the huge downturn that they've had. I don't think the Dodgers are going to be able to flip the switch, and uh, I think it's going to be kind of unfair to Dave Roberts if he ends up taking some heat over this because there's going to be the sense that the Dodgers are just back where they were prior to when he got there. I think Dave Roberts has done a better job than Mattingly did of getting more out of this team, but I think the results are going to be the same. I'll say Arizona in four. Yeah, I think it, I, I, I'm, I think that's totally right. I say Arizona in five because I think Robbie Ray is going to have to two games. Robbie Ray is like the best pitcher that nobody knows about, 15-5 and five this year, 2.89 ERA. Now, the one thing against our analysis, because I'm picking Arizona as well, is the Dodgers, who have traditionally been terrible against left-handed pitching, they've been pretty good against lefties this year, but Robbie Ray has been unbelievable. I point to the games when the Dodgers went south, as great as they were, and then they went 1-15, and 15, which is kind of unfathomable. Uh, in August and September, the Diamondbacks played the Dodgers six times and won all six. Even before that, though, they were not going to be afraid of the Dodgers. When you play a team in your own division, rarely are you afraid of them. They might be better than you, but rarely are you afraid of them, and Arizona is no exception. So I think Robbie Ray is going to have to pitch two games in that series, and I think with those two and Greinke, I think they can with three. You know, Corbin's okay. Their pitching staff is not nearly as deep as the Dodgers. But, you know, I remember when they named Kershaw the game one starter, and I think on MLB Network the announcer was like, duh, well, of course it's going to be Kershaw. But I have to tell you, Rick, I was thinking this year, at what point do you say Kershaw is now 4-7 and seven with a 4.55 ERA in the playoffs? That's a pretty big sample in the playoffs. You don't have a lot of guys to pitch, you know, so many more games than he's pitched. Uh, and that's horrific. Right. And they tried last year, you know, he got that save, and he pitched six innings well one game. Oh, he's off the schneid and this. No, no, he's not. He still has a proven that for whatever reason, um, I don't know if I want to say Kershaw is Peyton Manning-like. Um, incredible regular season playoff guy, not so good in the playoffs. But I will say this, um, in New York, it's like... Uh, blasphemy to say that anybody's as good as Sandy Koufax. And I'm actually old enough to have seen Koufax like shut out the Mets every year when the Mets started playing in the 60s. It was like my father, who was a big-time baseball guy, nobody went to see the Mets in the early mid-60s to see the Mets. They all went to see the National League because they had been gone for four or five years. So we go see the Mets and the Giants to see Willie Mays. We right. go see the Pirates to see Clemente. Well, we go see the Dodgers, not so much in 62. He didn't become godlike, I think, until 63, 64, 65, 66. And we just go whenever Koufax pitch, and it seemed to me like he shut out the Mets every year. Now, they were terrible. But my point is, I have said, and this is blasphemy in New York, I have said that to me, Clayton Kershaw in the regular season is as good as Sandy Koufax. And then I'll say, just go look at the numbers. And... But Kershaw in the playoffs, Koufax in the playoffs, had like a sub-1 ERA. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, there's that, that story, I don't know if it's true, that Mickey Mantle gets up against him for the first time in the 63 World Series, and after he struck out, on the way back said, how can anybody hit this guy? I don't know if that's true. Mantle is kind of that kind of guy, though, almost to say it. And, of course, the Dodgers swept the Yankees in the 63 Series. But... Kershaw in the postseason, I did not think it was out of the realm of possibility, maybe I'm a dreamer, to consider not starting Kershaw in game one. Because if he's bad Kershaw again and has to pitch two games, that's like playing right into Arizona's hands. Now, I don't know if if Darvish, who apparently is going to start game three because he's better on the road, I guess Rich Hill is going to start game two because he's better at home. Um, and Alex Wood, who's like my favorite guy, 10-0, 1.67 ERA the first half, didn't even make the All-Star team. I mean, what's up with that? So, so I thought it was not out of the realm of possibility that they picked someone else to start game one. I guess that would really insult Kershaw, maybe upset the Dodgers, who look upon him as a god. And he's a regular season god, but I'll say it again. They're risking something that if he's just not Clayton Kershaw, if he's Clayton Kershaw postseason Clayton as opposed to regular season Clayton, the Dodgers have virtually no chance to win this series. And when you look at their depth, Darvish, Hill, Alex Wood, that's incredible. So I'm with you. I have it going five games, though, um, 
because I don't know where else they're going to get it uh, pitching-wise, uh, Arizona. Uh, but we'll see what happens. I think that's going to be, I don't know if it's going to be the hot pick or the smart money pick, uh, but certainly Arizona doesn't fear the Dodgers. They beat them the last six times they played. And to me, until it's answered, there's still a gigantic question mark, Clayton Kershaw, in the playoffs. Exactly. And uh, as far as uh, trend setting goes, you mentioned earlier about Andrew Miller with the Indians. Uh, the Diamondbacks have been doing a lot the same this year with Archie Bradley, who's been a prospect where they've struggled to get a lot out of him as a starting pitcher at a young stage in his career. They're using him as a super reliever. We'll see how that plays out. Turning back to Miller and the Indians for a moment, you and I both have the Indians and the Astros in the American League Championship Series. A perfect agreement on everything thus far. This is another one where, again, I look at it, and this is what I'm going to say about the Indians writ large. The one thing I will say as an Indians fan that makes me a little bit uneasy is I look at this year as opposed to last year in terms of the talent acquisitions, in terms of the health of the team, Bradley Zimmer in center field is the one thing you could point to, but you were at the point where he'd been around the loop once or twice, and he was only really giving you defense at that point. Uh, He hadn't been able to make the adjustments yet offensively. It hurts not having him in there for his great defense, but that's about the size of it. This roster on paper is so much better than it was a year ago, but October is so freaking random, it is pretty much like March Madness. But the Indians, I feel, on the other hand, what, what kind of outweighs that a little bit in my mind and makes me kind of breathe easy is the Indians, to me, have the feel of a team with their pitching depth, with their hitting depth. It's almost really been kind of a, a hero of the day situation with different guys rising up at different points, even right down to, I look behind the plate, and, and again, I, I look longingly toward 2018 for the era of the great prospect uh, Francisco Mejia behind the plate here. But Jan Gomes and Roberto Perez, say what you will, every one of their combined, I think it's about 18 home runs or so, has been impactful. These guys don't do much offensively, but seemingly every time they do, it means something, which is weird. I, I'd, I'd love to see like what the clutch statistics are. I'll have to look for a breakdown on that, but... The Indians, to me, are a team that can kind of get past some of the randomness that happens in the month of October. So as much as people are looking at it and saying, well, look at the Astros since they got Verlander, look at how great he's been there. Yeah, but the Indians have uh, done pretty well against Verlander in recent years here, albeit a lot of that was the kind of beaten down version of Verlander prior to what you're seeing from him now. But uh, I, I think, again... The Astros have what it takes to to extend anybody into a deep series right about now, and they're an exciting and a very scary young team. But I do think that October experience is going to play a role here in this series. I will say Indians in six nail-biting, thrilling games. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Indians as well. I mean, again, I picked Indians over the Cubs, frankly, before the year started, and I don't see a reason. I, I, I could make some arguments, but I don't see a reason to go off that. And I don't think you can really, if you can get back there, Again, you can't duplicate, like I say, for example, the Astros. A big difference in the Astros this year is they have a Carlos Beltran. Um, they have a Brian McCann. That's a big difference between them last year and them this year. Uh, they've added a Justin Verlander. So, again, on uh, paper, you would going, what were they missing? Because their stars played the whole year last year. Springer was unbelievable all year. Correa was unbelievable. Yeah. Altuve was Altuve. Not the case this year. Um, but, again, I think... And it's hard to get back. I think they're both going to get back, the Cubs and the Indians. I think the Indians have enough. On your interesting uh, catcher, uh, Roberto Perez and Jan Gomes, um, you know, you're totally right. Combined, they were 22 home runs and 94 RBIs, and that's a heck of a major league catcher in today's world. Uh, So you're totally right about that as well. I just think uh, the Indians are incredibly deep. It is literally, uh, who's going to be the star today? Raise your hand. Oh, we got five guys today who can be it. Okay. Uh, Jake was a big addition. Again, if you saw him play for the Mets this year versus last year, and of course, he's played pretty well for the Indians as well. But he's a good hitter. You'll recall last year when the Mets got him, I think he was leading, I think he was second in homers and leading the National League in RBIs when the Mets got him. And this was going to put the Mets over the top, and he was terrific. But as often happens when it comes to New York, you know, it takes some time. Gregorius the same way with the Yankees. Now Gregorius is an all-star, and Bruce was was great for the Mets, and he's been really good for Cleveland. And again, he's one of, you tell me, six, seven guys. There's so many guys on the Indians. So I like the Indians. go seven games on the Indians over the Astros because I do respect and think the Astros are that good. 
they are an excellent, excellent young team, and uh, they are the future, no question about it. You go to the National League, you and I both have it being Diamondbacks v. Cubs. My gut wants me to go one round more and to say uh, Arizona. My, my, my gut is pushing me in that direction. My preseason pick, by the way, was Indians over Cubs, so I'm going to stick with those teams making the World Series. In the end, one of the things that, it, that really troubles me about picking Arizona I think it may not hurt them against the Dodgers. I think it may hurt them subsequently here is that uh, the, the depth that the Cubs have, and we all know what Joe Madden can do with every one of the hitters on his roster. Arizona's not playing with a full deck as far as that goes. David Peralta is out. Chris Owings is out. Uh, Yasmani Tomas, who when healthy can be uh, something of a difference maker, is out. Uh, there's three key guys right there. Joe Madden always seems to get the most out of everybody that he's got, including his bench guys, his super utility guys, uh, like Zobrist or anybody else. I think the ability for uh, Madden to be able to play mix and match a lot more than what Arizona is going to do is going to be decisive. I'll have that one going seven, and I think it'll be very exciting, but I'll take the Cubs to make it back to the World Series in their third consecutive NLCS appearance. Yeah, I wish we had Joe Stazak on because I am just guessing that he would have had something different. We're essentially on the same page, you know, throughout the playoffs. But again, I, I think, I don't think that's because I picked as you Indians over Cubs before the year started. But certainly if there's a dead, if there's a dead heat in my analysis, and there have been a few, that's going to tip me to pick the, uh, the Indians and the Cubs. And, Again, I think those are the two best managers in baseball. And people say, "Oh, the manager doesn't really matter in baseball." That's you know, that's just ignorance. If you hear somebody say that, and a lot of people do say that, they just don't know baseball. So I think uh, the Cubs have enough. I do like the Diamondbacks, um, but I'm going to pick the Cubs, and I'll pick them to go in seven as well. Uh, I just think they're in the clutch, going to be a better team, and and. I totally agree with what you said about Joe Madden. He gets the most out of everybody. And I'll even say, uh, Ben Zobers, when they turned the bright lights on, you know, he won the World Series in 2015 with the Royals. He won the World Series in 2016 with the Cubs. And as Joe Madden said many years ago, this is the guy you want on your team if you want to win the game. Uh, and I think he's going to be. And I also wanted to mention on the Cubs, which I should have mentioned before, um, Probably the trade of the year, I think, the trade of the year for the uh, in baseball was Wade Davis from the Royals to Jorge Soler of the Cubs, and Soler looked like a really good player last year. Uh, but Wade Davis solidified their bullpen, 32 saves. Uh, meanwhile, the Royals would have made the playoffs easily if they had Wade Davis. Soler wound up in the minor leagues up and down and hit like 180 last year. He still might be good in the future. But I think that was, and that was just a one-for-one deal. I think that was like the steal of the year, and that really has made the Cubs uh, really look better, frankly, on the back end. So we'll have to see what happens. But, yes, um, I have the Cubs winning the National League, the Indians winning the American League. I have the Indians uh, winning the World Series. And that was just something after watching both teams last year and seeing, frankly, how young they are and what stars they have coming. And you're right, with the Cubs, they disappointed a little, but I think they're back on track now. And again, I think they'll all look at it as a new season now and take advantage. And they certainly have the talent to take advantage and be really good in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I agree with where you're coming from on all of that. And uh, again, the, the Cubs there with trading Soler, much like what they did with uh, Eloy Jimenez, of where, again, you're, you're playing to win it now, you have the young players, you can get the assets to make you better. They certainly needed to get Wade Davis in there when they let uh, Chapman get away, which I think was pretty much their plan all along. But you look at it, and uh, again, I go the same way in terms of looking at the World Series, because as close as it was last year, the Cubs just for whatever reason, have kind of struggled this year. Again, part of it is, too, the Cubs were on uh, an unbelievable mission in 2016, and you can't replicate that. When, when you've broken the 108-year curse, the Indians are the hungry team of the two, no question about it. Cleveland is now the franchise that's gone the longest in MLB without this happening. Now, I said last year, I said we don't tend to get this in baseball. 
you don't tend to get the same two teams back in there. And I said, if not next year, then at some point in the next couple of years, I think it'll happen again. Because you look at the repeat pennant winners of recent years, San Francisco, Texas, Kansas City. There have been a number of teams this decade that have won more than one pennant, uh, St. Louis. And yet, we haven't gotten a, a rematch. This, I think, is going to be the one that does it, I think, and, and you've already said you agree with that. And this is a thing where, whether they admit it or not at the MLB offices, I, I think they're going to be thrilled because they've seen, we've seen the last couple of years in the NBA, also with the Cleveland franchise here, the Cavs, what kind of interest. Now, again, we, we could have a very robust discussion about uh, what it does to the regular season and the rest of the playoffs leading up to it, but at the very least, that kind of rivalry in the finals is something that really has benefited the league in terms of ratings and everything else like that. The World Series last year uh, did BAFO ratings relative to what it's been the last several years. A lot of that was based off of, obviously, the Cubs quest, but a lot of it was, too. The Indians were the second longest team never to win the right. World Series, and now the longest team. And for them to try to get it back against the team that beat them, yeah, I mean, that's storylines galore right there. I think that's going to be another big October for ratings in the World Series if it happens. I'm going to say Indians in, uh, I think, six, because I called the shot last year. Uh, it was on the podcast with you and Joe Stazek, and I thought I was on with you guys before game six, and I thought that was going to be the one. And uh, I'll, I'll just say I was right a year later. I'll say uh, six games, <laughs> and uh, it, it really, that is something where, again, with the, the Indians would have home field advantage in the World Series against anybody other than the Dodgers since they went to the best record thing here this year. We've already established that that won't be the case. So the chance to do it at home, that's what's really been interesting. The Indians, the times in my lifetime, the three times when they've won the pennant, it's never been at home. Uh, it's the, the Cavs won the NBA championship on the road. They have won uh, the Eastern Conference championship here. Uh, and the first time they did it, it was pretty special. It was a pretty big deal. But nothing on the stage of winning a world championship here. I've gone back to, as somebody who watched uh, Stipe uh, defend the UFC World Heavyweight Championship last fall here, the, the roar at the queue when that happened, I'm telling you, the 20,000 people cheering on the hometown guy, the heavyweight champion of the world, I said at the time, it couldn't have been any louder if the Cavs won the NBA championship. Well, I think, again, it'll be a crowd about twice the size because it'll be outside, and you know Stipe's going to be in the crowd because he represents for this team everywhere. I, I loved him going to Wrigley Field and representing in the World Series last year, but uh, I think it'll be a Stipe title defense type roar at the end of Game 6 here. Uh, I have the Indians uh, completing the mission and getting it done this year. Well, I'm going to go Indians in seven. I think a lot of these later series are going to go the distance uh, again because I think on paper uh, you can make a case that the Cubs should not make it, definitely, and you can make a case that the Astros can beat the Indians. Neither of us have made that case, although we did, at least on paper, I think, try and make it. I think the Cubs are the first, trying to become the first national team since the Big Red Machine in the 70s, 75, 76, I think. Um, to win back-to-back -back pennants, obviously it's happened in the American League, but I don't think it's happened in the National League since the mid-70s. And although that's, you know, well, who cares, what does that really mean? Uh, to me, that means something. But I just think the Indians, it's their time, and I totally agree with you. I think the uh, analysis that I may steal from you uh, is, yes, what the Cubs did last year, 1908, uh, everybody was, most people were pulling for them. I think that will switch to the Indians this year, uh, 1948, uh, and they're the longest tenured now people to have not, teams to have not won a world championship. So I think that flips it a little, but again, both of these teams are, are well experienced. Obviously, they played the seven game World Series last year, and I put a lot of stock in that. Obviously, the Indians could have won last year, and I think they will win this year. Well, the one thing, if we had Stazak here, he'd be quick to point this out. You're right about that, except for 08 09 Phillies. And remember, the Phillies didn't get it done the second time either. Past could be prologue. Right, no, they did not win back to back. Yeah, no, it's kind of amazing. I, I wasn't really aware until I looked back on some of these things that it's been over 40 years since the National League team has won back to back. Uh, also interesting that the Big Red Machine only won two in a row. Uh, you would have thought even now looking back, but even then at the time, that they were going to win four or five World Series, and they 
they simply did not. Uh, but uh, it's tough to overcome history, and you're right, the Phillies almost did do it. And now, unfortunately for the Phillies, they're at the bottom, although I will say they do have some good young talent, uh, having watched a number of their games this year. Well, you know, and it's it's funny. I've taken great joy in ragging on uh, a good friend and fellow show contributor Russ Cohen uh, for the great gift that the Mets gave and uh, Jay Bruce coming here. And and again, you talk about a guy that has been like a fan favorite from day one. And I'm telling you, I mean, the, the guy comes up and you got the Bruce going on, and you know, it's. The, the way that they've taken to him, it's one of these things where, again, I know the payroll's already been pushed past what I expected or most people, although the minority owner coming in and putting money into this team about two years ago, I think, has been very decisive in that regard. But uh, I speak for all Indians fans, win, lose, or draw this October, and saying, I want to see a way to make it happen next year uh, with him. And, again, he's been so receptive to it, too. I mean, you, you look at these interviews with him, like he can't believe he's in this kind of a climate after some of the teams that he's played on. So uh, he really loves being here and I think doesn't want to leave. And uh, hopefully they can meet somewhere in the middle of this uh, postseason. I say that as an Indians fan and keep him here. Like I said, win, lose, or draw. But uh, I think it'll be off of the kind of happy ending to a season we haven't seen on the North Coast since 1948 and uh, again it's going to be an epic playoff run regardless it's uh, going to be uh, amazing to watch and as I knew it would be amazing to break it down with you my friend Steve Callis thank you as always so much for being here and being a part of this and giving us so much great baseball talk today always a pleasure Rick anytime appreciate it buddy thank you so much and thank you everybody for tuning in today to FDH Lounge mini episode number 887 as we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio. Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.